the mystery surrounding the deaths of Utah family has now been solved. Two parents in their 30s, three of the four children died of drug overdose. One of the most powerful culprits was liquid methadone, which had been prescribed for the mother, Judy. So how about my theory that maybe she was in low-grade methadone withdrawal and that's what made her crazy? Or maybe she was already crazy. I'm back. It's a pejorative term. Maybe she had already some sort of chronic psychotic condition that predisposed to her drug addiction as well. I absolutely agree with you, Dr. Drew. I was just thinking about the fact that if she had been non-compliant with her methadone, that leads to side effects, including paranoia yep. and psychosis. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Absolutely. Exactly. So if that happens, you can see the narrative happening. She starts to have ideas that maybe people are out to hurt her family. So she decides she needs to kill all of them to save them. And what does she have on hand? The extra methadone that she didn't take. And dad, I guess, was on heroin. Yeah. So, I mean, a meltdown, Sam. There's so yeah. much going on in this family. There's a lot more than met the eye. The, even though everyone seemed to think it was okay. There was a lot going on. I actually, Dr. Drew, think that the dad was the leader in all of this. I mean, it was the mother that was coming off of the heroin addiction. And, and the dad, if you look at the police report, he was the one, or at least they believe, tucked everybody in because the children and the mother were tucked, tucked in up to their neck. He was not tucked in, so they believe that he had the poison last. So I think that he somehow was the one that, that brainwashed everybody. It, it kind of makes sense, Erica. He may have given the more slow, slower acting oral medicine to everybody and then took the big IV dose for himself at the very end. Yeah, and you know, you can look at it as, oh, maybe this is a humane way to kill a family, Ooh. but unfortunately well, there's no. nothing humane about this. What is it okay? humane about no, killing saying, people? A, not, I mean, no, I'm saying I, people are saying that, though. People are saying because there was no guns or knives involved, but at the same time, this is killing a family who did not want to be killed. Little children are not deciding that they want to go. This was a, an act of delusionary behavior. They were delusional, thinking that the world was going to end. They were slowly getting themselves away from society, from friends and family, and unfortunately, you know, it, it wasn't an it wasn't loud enough and their behavior wasn't, you know, out there enough that that people on, on the, their friends and family level well, did, Erica, you know, were able to do anything. From Nadja Kajuji's computer in her dorm room in Canada and from dozens of other computers all over the world, the connection to William Melcher Dinkle led here to southern Minnesota and the town of Faribault, population 22,000. It's tidy, middle class and home of the Faribault High School Falcons, where Melcher Dinkle apparently got one of his screen names. Falcon girl. To neighbors, he was an unimposing family man. But soon after the police questioned him about Naja Kajuji's death, Melcher Dinkle went to the local emergency room. According to hospital records, he complained that he suffered from a suicide fetish and addiction to internet suicide websites. He said he felt guilty and worthless. Since then, the Minnesota Board of Nursing has revoked his license, citing a long list of incompetence, mistreatment of patients, and his unethical conduct in aiding suicide. But by the fall of 2009, still no arrest, no charges, and no day in court for William Melcher Dinkle, something Naja Kajuji's mother found hard to live with. I want charges laid, and I want them to laid in Minnesota, actually, not here. Um, and I want him to be found guilty and go to jail, and thereby sending a very clear message to internet predators. Um, because there are a lot more of them out there, and it will send a very clear message that the Internet does not provide them a sanctuary. But Sergeant Paul Schnell of the St. Paul Police says his state's assisted suicide law has never been used to prosecute someone for encouraging suicide over the Internet. We end up in a, in a spot where these are very complex investigations that are no longer, you know, somebody victimizing their neighbor or somebody in a nearby community. We're not talking about being able to do it on the other side of the world. Well, the whole of Anglesey is a tourist attraction. The Menai Straits is famous for water sports, the skiing, kayaking. It's famous for its mussels. There's a mussel farm. I believe they're exported all over the world. So although it's a sleepy part of the world, there's a lot of interest in businesses. There's a lot of interest in sites. It's just a beautiful part of the country. The majority of the inhabitants of the village itself are Welsh-speaking and have lived in the area all their lives. Llanfair PG has an exceedingly low crime level. The population is elderly. They would have felt secure in that environment with very, very little violence taking place. 
On Sunday, the 25th of November, 2001, one of the elderly residents was due to have her lunch delivered at 12.30 p.m., but she wasn't opening the door. Northwest Police received a call from a Meals on Wheels lady who visited the home. Tried to get the attention of the lady living in the address. The delivery lady knew that the owner of the house, 90-year-old Mabel Lachon, was hard of hearing, so went round the back of the property to see if she could get her attention. She found that the French window had been broken, so immediately felt that was suspicious. Mabel lived alone and rarely left the house. Please, please. Hey, there's been a break-in. Mabel Lachon. Yes, she lives there. Um... Officers were dispatched to the house. They got no response from the front door, went round the back. She noticed that the glass had been broken, climbed in. She went into the rear of the house, um, and it's like a, a dining room area, through into the hallway, turned left. Now, the curtains were shut. There was a almost a reddish glow uh, from, the, from the light that was on. So she walked through and found uh, the elderly lady sitting in a chair with a blanket which was up to her head so she couldn't actually see her face. So she walked over, removed the blanket from her face and was immediately faced with this um, lady who was dead. Mabel had obvious stab wounds to her neck and chest, so the officer was in no doubt that she was looking at a murder scene and immediately called for backup. Detective Superintendent John Clayton was on call that day. When I got the call, I was parked at the back of police headquarters, just putting some air in the tyre with my windsurfer on the roof, just about to go windsurfing uh, over to Anglesey, uh, just north of the Menai Straits. So a call came in from the control, an inspector, a colleague of mine that I've known for years, and he said, uh, you know, JC, you better go over to Anglesey. Um, there's a serious incident that you need to take uh, control of, and so that's what I did. The area had been cordoned off, and along with the forensic science examiners, the officers went into the property. We went in through, through the point of entry, which is the back of the house, through the broken glass. And we slowly moved through the house, making a record of it with a video camera. Uh, we were all um, dressed in forensic suits, so we were completely covered, mouth to foot, hands, gloves, everything. And we moved through to the lounge, and we saw what the police officer had seen, Mabel still sitting in her chair with a blanket covering her. There was, on the floor, some crossed pokers and some candlesticks. It was almost set out like a almost like a shrine of, of some description. That's, that's how I would describe it. It's the strangest things that I've ever seen at, at, a, at a murder investigation. To the left of, of Mabel on the floor, there was quite clearly a pan, a very small milk pan. On top of the milk pan, there was a, a small package which was wrapped in newspaper. It was quite obvious looking around the scene that something macabre had, um, had taken place. The newspaper package was covered in blood, but the officers didn't know what was inside it. We removed the blanket. The chest cavity was open, and it had been very roughly cut open, and a heart was no longer there. We had our suspicions at that point that something really odd had taken place. For me and other people present, it was the most unusual crime that any of us had seen. Police continued to remove potential evidence from the flat above a pub where Matthew Pike was stabbed to death. But attention was also focused on the complex world of computer games and online forums. And in particular, a military strategy game called Advance Wars. Matthew Pike, a 20-year-old student, ran a website for people to discuss the game, helped by his girlfriend, Joanna Witten. A few days after she discovered his body, a German computer game enthusiast, calling himself David Heiss, 
left a message on her Facebook page. The message said, You must be suffering unbelievable pain. I'm sorry for causing so much trouble lately. This led Nottinghamshire police to Germany, and legal efforts are underway to bring their suspect back to Britain. Police believe Matthew Pike knew his killer. They're now examining the possibility that they met on the internet. Police have appealed for the public's help in trying to find the murder weapon. They've also asked people to be on the lookout for any discarded clothing which could be heavily bloodstained. The victim's website is no longer active, but it bears a message from a friend who says, I hope whoever did this to you is brought to justice swiftly. David Crabtree, Sky News, Nottingham. A tough prison sentence today for a killer. Tough sentence and tough words from the judge presiding over the murder case of Michelle Lay. Giselle Esteban will face 25 years to life for killing student Lay, her former best friend. The judge admonished Esteban for showing no signs of remorse. ABC 7 News reporter Nick Smith is live from the Alameda County Courthouse, where it was an extremely emotional day for the victim's family, wasn't it, Nick? It was indeed, Dan. You know, Superior Court Judge John Rolfson handed down the sentence after telling a packed courtroom that Giselle Esteban, quote, showed no signs of remorse and that her actions were, oh, just without remorse. I guess just a sense of relief that uh, at the very least we don't have to deal with this for at least for another 20 years or so. An Alameda County judge sentenced Giselle Esteban to 25 years to life for the first degree murder of nursing student Michelle Lay and then dumping her body in a remote part of Pleasanton, calling her actions cold-blooded and premeditated. We always felt, sitting in trial, that she felt no remorse. Um, just stared directly at our family with a blank stare. Michelle's brother Michael Lay broke down as he talked about his sister, the plans Michelle had for her life, and how she wanted to follow in their late mother's footsteps and become a nurse. Those dreams ended the day the 26-year-old student went missing from a parking garage in Hayward last year. The Lay family's worst fears were confirmed when after weeks of searches by police and volunteers, her decomposed body was found in a remote area near Pleasanton. Today, the family is trying to heal while hoping that their words will be remembered many years from now in 2029 when Michelle's killer could be up for parole. We just want them to know after 25 years to know how unique this case was and, and to give a face to, to Michelle's case. Giselle Esteban's brother and sister left the courtroom without talking to the media. The judge offered words of comfort to the Lay family about their loss, telling them that you never get over it. You only learn to get through it. In Alameda County, Nick Smith, ABC 7 News. Got profound words. All right, Nick, thanks very much. Good morning. We have some breaking news for you now. A Victorian woman who stalked and murdered her 15-year-old friend in 1999 has just been released on parole after serving 14 years in prison. Let's go live to Today Melbourne reporter Justine Conway. Justine, what more can you tell us about the release? We understand it just happened moments ago. That's right, Sylvia. Just moments ago, Caroline Reed Robertson was wearing a dark coloured baseball cap and she was picked up by two friends who drove her away to begin her life of freedom. According to fellow inmates here at the Dame Phyllis Frost Centre, uh, she never really spoke about her crime during her time in custody. That crime, of course, was so shocking. It's inspired books and even a telemovie. Uh, in 1999, she strangled her friend, her younger friend, 15 year old. Rachel Barber, she hid her body in a wardrobe for several days before burying it in a shallow grave. And this was all in a sick attempt to try and assume the 15-year-old's identity. She wanted to be as beautiful as Rachel, have that personality and that life. And she thought if she killed her, she could become her. So uh, today is a very tough day for the Barber family, Sylvia. They uh, had been hoping that she would spend more time in jail. All they hope now, though, is that she will continue her rehabilitation while outside prison. All right, Justin Conway with that breaking news. Thank you. This interview is being um, recorded at uh, Patchway Police Station in Bristol. It is now Tuesday, the 3rd of March, 2015, and it's exactly 12 midday. Um, I'm DC 3302, Marie Stephen, and the other police officer present is... DC Mark Luther 2702. 
Nathan, can you give us your full name? Nathan Charles Matthews. Thank you. And your date of birth? The 9th of the 1st, 1987. Thank you. And the other people present in the interview are? Robin Rowland of the Crossroads Sisters. And this Warlock, appropriate adult. Thank you. So, Nathan, we've had a short break. Um, perhaps if I just flag up for the um, recording what this interview is about. It's about the kidnap and murder of Becky Watts. Um, over the last couple of days we've had four recordings. The last was a very short recording and I know you needed to have a break then. I explained to you this morning why we needed to, rather than simply take at face value the written statement that you have given to us last night, that we need to explore what you've told us some more. Um, I know that was difficult for you first thing this morning, but that's what we need to carry on and do, and ask you some more questions. Can you rephrase? Um. I don't know what questions you need to ask, but obviously you said something about um, something about Shauna. Can you rephrase it? Mm -hmm. So we can include basically everybody in it and not use her name. Like, do you want me to say I think, yeah, the, the other person? Know. Is it just saying the name? <laughs> Just include everybody in it. Like, yeah. obviously she's in. Obviously, okay. we'll be included in it, but include everybody. Don't say her name. Okay. Okay. I'll do my best to avoid using that name where I can. Nathan, okay. I can't make promises. And what I would say to you is that I'm not going to be doing anything to deliberately wind you up or anything like that. Okay. Um. But we've obviously been here a long time, and if I make a slip up, it may well be because I'm tired and those things happen, okay? <coughs> Can you tell me then, Nathan, because if we work through what you told us in this written statement, this um, so idea that you, you had... Obviously you obviously, I think you wanted more detail, yeah. was it? Yeah, I um, Obviously, I sh should be able to go into more detail. Mm -hmm. Remember but the obviously. discussion we had before coming in, though? Huh? Remember the discussion we had before coming in? I don't know. There are a couple of are ways. Are you going to have to. Are you going to have to read that statement. No. There are a couple of ways we could get around this. <coughs> obviously, I don't want that to be read to someone. <coughs> <coughs> I don't want to read this out in full again, Nathan, but what I wanted to do <coughs> was get some more detail from you about things that you've said in it. So perhaps if I could pull out some things from what you've told us and ask you to expand on it, tell us a bit more. Does that sound all right? <clears throat> How about if we start with this idea you had about scaring Becky? Tell me about how that started up then, how you got that idea. Uh, I don't know if it was on TV or something like that, but obviously I had a couple of dreams about... Nathan, at this point, I can't keep interrupting, but do you remember the discussions we had before you came into interview? And how, we, how you and I discussed you dealing with the interview? What was the question again? About the 
the idea that you got and you said it might have been something on TV or you had a dream? Well, also I came up with the idea to scare her because like to try and basically make her more appreciative mm -hmm. of life so she'd be more appreciative for other people she'd be like grateful that you know she wasn't harmed or anything like that or you know because obviously um, she'd leave things out on the floor of my mum to trip over and obviously would talk to her um, like so saying uh, nasty comments and talk to her like dirt on the floor and obviously I thought if I was you know able to scare her and obviously her not be harmed and obviously be released obviously when she got back <coughs> She obviously would have been scared and more appreciative of things as people are. Okay. So tell me what you thought you were going to do. What your plan was. So obviously stick her in the suitcase. Obviously, um... Obviously put tape around her mouth so she wouldn't make any noise. And then, <sighs> I don't want to interrupt you, Nathan, but just one thing, it might be difficult to hear this later. Do you reckon you could speak up a bit? Obviously, I, what, um, what the plan was obviously once I got her in the car to make up some up to say to... say to Shauna, um, obviously I had to leave, like, to help someone or do something or some up. And obviously I was going to, um, I was thinking of like a wooded area or whatever to obviously take her back out, to obviously still have the mask on. And obviously like scare her and, you know, say some along the lines of, you know, you've got to start treating people. Um, start treating people better, you know, not being a bitch or self-centred. Um, and then, like, make a threat of, um, you know, or you know, or this could happen again or worse or something like that. And obviously, um, <coughs> I hadn't figured out exactly how to, obviously, Walk like obviously walk away after without obviously. But then if she try and follow, I'm assuming she wouldn't have followed because of out of fear he wouldn't want to follow someone who just obviously has done that, and obviously would have come back. Well, I would have obviously um, chucked away obviously everything first and then come back, and obviously would have acted as normal. That come back to my mum's, obviously acted as normal. So when did you think all of this up? I can't be certain. I'm no good with dates. Okay. I've said this repeatedly in days muddling to other days. I don't have a specific memory yeah. of coming up with it, but I remember thinking about it a couple of times. Just basically trying to think of ways to... Because obviously she, don't li she won't listen to me about leaving shit on the floor for my mum to trip up. Um, she doesn't listen to her dad about it. Just trying to make, find a way of making her actually listen. Had you had a conversation with her soon before that? I can't. Rem I can't remember when I last saw her. Like I said in the statement, it could have been okay. Wednesday when we went over, or it could have been the Monday before. It depends on when she was in and when she wasn't in. And if she was in, it depends on when she would have come down. Nathan, do you think you want some legal advice at this stage, given that this is going differently than we discussed? Um, I don't know, probably here. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's 12.11pm.